All right, welcome back. Theological method. We've been talking about how do you do the work of theology. So remember, most of the time we're engaging in systematic theology. And what is the basis? All right, we started with the Bible or the canon at the very foundation. So make sure you remember that. Where do we start? Not my ideas, not your ideas, not John Calvin's ideas. We want to go to the Bible. Then we go to good hermeneutics. Now to our third step. We're going to talk about exegesis. All right, when you think of exegesis, sometimes a helpful cue to remember is exit, exegesis. So think of an exit as we're going out. You're leaving. Eisegesis is where a person is reading into. We're entering into, but exit, we're going out of. So exegesis is we are drawing out of the scripture its meaning, and we're answering the question, what does the text say? When you answer that question, you're doing exegesis. So many of you sit under pulpits on a weekly basis, or if you don't have the privilege of seeing that in your local church, then you're watching a, a video of a sermon, and you're hearing a pastor go line by line, text by text, paragraph by paragraph, and expositing the scripture. What are they doing? Well, to a certain degree, hopefully they're just not a running commentary on it. Well, this verb means this, and this participle means this. Hopefully they're doing more than that and actually preaching and synthesizing, but yet they're expositing the text. They're telling you exactly what the text says and what the text means. So when your pastor says, all right, read with me Revelation 12, one through eight, and then he says, all right, and here is what the text means. He is expositing that text to us. And, and praise the Lord, we have pastors that do that, including pastors that preach through Revelation for us. So when we begin to get at this idea of, all right, take your hermeneutics and then draw out exegesis, exegesis. And when you are drawing out, you are not putting in, you are bringing out. So the right theological method means you go to the Bible and you say, you know what, here is my suspicion. You know what a hypothesis is, right? It's here is my working hypothesis. I think the Bible is going to say this about man. And then you go to the Bible and you're like, you know what? It actually didn't say that. Hmm, how interesting. It said this. So you are letting the Bible inform your doctrine instead of taking your beliefs and looking for a proof text into the Bible. This is where certain doctrines that are unbiblical actually go to the Bible and look for a proof text. For example, prosperity gospel. Unbiblical, when you study the Bible and affliction or God's blessing or trials or what prosperity really means, you cannot come away from the Bible and say the prosperity gospel is true. But what you can do is develop that idea in your own mind and then go to the Bible and look for proof texts here and there. You are eisegeting because you're taking your idea and reading it back into the text of Scripture. So that's obviously faulty because you can basically find any support you want when you take the Scripture out of context. So conversely, what are we doing then? With exegesis, we want to go and say, all right, what does the Bible say about prosperity? Well, the Bible has a lot to say about prosperity, but it's not what I might think, especially in a modern North American context. So I want to draw out the Bible, not read into the Bible my own thoughts. When I do that, I am doing the work of exegesis, and you are doing the work of exegesis. So first step, Bible. We go to the Bible. The Bible is our authority. Second step, hermeneutics. Good hermeneutics. Sound hermeneutics. And then from there, we explain the meaning. You're seeing the build here. Bible starts, hermeneutics, exegesis. And this is typically where we're going to go next to what is called biblical theology. Let me read a definition of biblical theology for you. What does an individual author or section in historical development say. Now, intramurally, and this isn't super important for you to know, but intramurally, there's going to be different debates about biblical theology. But I want you to think of biblical theology in a limited way. So systematic is going to be much more broad, and, and biblical theology is going to be much more limited. So for instance, what does Isaiah have to say about the servant Messiah? Biblical theology. 
Or maybe you're actually going to trace the idea of servant Messiah through the Old Testament. Okay, you're still doing a level of biblical theology. Uh, you want to see what perhaps this idea of servant Messiah begins to look like in the New Testament, where Jesus even begins to claim that he did not come to serve, but to be served, Matthew 20. Okay, Anytime you're beginning to limit or delineate from the entire Bible, we're talking about something like biblical theology. There are guys and scholars and gals much smarter than me that get into biblical theology, and that is their jam. And there is a place for biblical theology. Usually what biblical theology is, is getting the parts on the table. So maybe you've built Legos before. I have the privilege of having three sons, and they go through different cycles of interest in Legos. And usually when we get this sweet Lego package, I am the parts manager. I don't want to brag, but one of the things I do is they get the book, and I get the, the plastic bag of Legos, and they begin to assemble, and they'll say, all right, I need a blue one that is four pieces long. And I say, perfect, here it is. Hand it to them. They assemble it, keep going. So think of biblical theology as getting the pieces of the scripture onto the table. And then what you're going to do is begin to assimilate them at the next step. That is why biblical theology typically comes before systematic theology, because it's limited. It's more limited in its scope. So when we get to systematic theology, and we will here in just a moment, you're actually looking at the broader scripture, the entirety of scripture, whereas biblical theology is just looking at the pieces of scripture, maybe a particular author, a particular genre, an era. I'm looking at the Babylonian captivity. And as I look at each of those, I am studying scripture or a theme or an author in that particular era. So next level, biblical theology. So just by way of review, first level, canon, second level, hermeneutics, third level, exegesis, and then fourth level, biblical theology. Okay, so now before we get to the next step, the idea of systematic theology, I, I want you to see that by the time I'm doing biblical theology, I already should have hermeneutical method, I already should be able to say, this is where I draw out, not read in. And ultimately, it doesn't matter what John Calvin said on that topic. What ultimately matters is what the Bible says on that topic. And if, if John Calvin was wrong on an issue, I want to go back to the Bible because I am practicing exegetical theology. The Bible informs it. So next we would go to systematic theology. So after biblical theology, in the theological pyramid and the theological method, we go to systematic theology. All right, now I mentioned this in one of the earlier episodes. If it's been a while since you've seen it, I would encourage you to even go back and refresh. But systematic theology, this is the idea of what does the Bible say on any given topic? The entire Bible. Not parts of the Bible, not one aspect of the Bible, but the entire Bible. When you do systematic theology, generally that's what we do most. So what does the Bible say about the love of God? Systematic theology. What does the Bible say about the deity of Christ? Systematic theology. What does the Bible say about demons? Systematic theology. All right, not to bother you, but you recognize the pattern here. I'm not just limiting to the Old Testament. I'm not just limiting it to the writings of Moses. I'm saying I want to know what the entire Bible says about this topic. So you're doing the work of systematic theology, but remember, according to the theological pyramid, that's not born out of thin air. That is built upon faithful biblical theology, exegesis, hermeneutics, and the canon itself. So if you're doing systematic theology accurately, then that isn't just me willy-nilly grabbing verses here and there without a hermeneutical stance. It's me saying, I need to go back to these passages, carefully translate, interpret them, and then begin to say, this is what that passage means, and this is how it answers what I'm studying. So your hermeneutics will shape your systematic theology. You know, maybe you have bad hermeneutics, or I have bad hermeneutics. In that way, that's going to misshape my theology. You see, sometimes when we get to a theological disagreement, we have to acknowledge that what's contributing to our theological disagreement is a different way of interpreting the Bible. If I am 
allegorizing a key text. It's not literal, but it's figurative. Then that will change a doctrine. That's where a lot of the disagreements on eschatology will come to play, is hermeneutics. And to include your ecclesiology. Do you believe that the church has replaced Israel? Do you believe that the church is going to inherit promises and those have now been spiritualized and spiritually realized through the church? If you do, that doctrine is based off of your hermeneutics. So when we get to systematic theology, we begin to assimilate what are called doctrines. I've used that term over and over. What is a doctrine? A doctrine is what the whole Bible teaches us on a particular topic. So think, uh, this is a, a quote from a modern theologian. The whole Bible, what the whole Bible teaches on a particular topic. Assimilate that doctrine, and now you're going to have systematics. So we have to be done for today, but what have we covered so far? All right, exegesis leads to biblical theology. Biblical theology leads to systematic theology. When we come back, I'm going to cover the idea of historical theology and then practical theology. I hope you can join us. <laughs>